And thank you, Elke, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, let's see. Is the yeah, okay. Uh, so in this work, we investigated the possibility of adding security to chips that are fabricated on plastic substrates. And it's a collaboration between uh, KU Leuven and iMac. So first I will say something about the technology, then about our implementation and our key hiding solution, and finally I will draw some conclusions. So um, flexible electronics on plastic substrates are commercially used for flexible displays. And in these displays, thin film transistors are used to control the current that is drawn from the pixels or subpixels sub in these displays. But a bit over five years ago, researchers started to notice that uh, this technology could also be used uh, to develop digital circuits on flexible foil. And that's why they started making these circuits, first very small, then larger and larger. And these circuits are mainly used in uh, passive uh, near field communication chips. Um, and they can be integrated because they are flexible, bendable, stretchable. They can be integrated in paper, cardboard, and plastic. So examples of circuits that have already been produced and tested are um, transponder chips and also an 8-bit microcontroller with a very reduced or very limited instruction set. Uh, but technology is not standing still, so there are a lot of evolutions and researchers are working actively to improve the technology. So in the near future, we can expect uh, applications such as uh, like smart packages, intelligent labels, electronic paper, etc., using this technology. Uh, so what does a transistor or a thin film transistor look like in this technology? So actually there are several options, um, but the option that at the moment shows the best performance and also the lowest production cost um, is amorphous metal oxide uh, thin film transistors. And you can see a cross section of a transistor here. So um, the semiconductor, yeah, so the substrate is plastic. Huh? Uh, the semiconductor is AXO. And AXO is the metal oxide semiconductor, and it stands for amorphous indium gallium zinc oxide. Uh, then uh, the metal that is used to connect the source and the drain and the gate, and also the metal layers and the via, is molybdenum. And then we use uh, silicon dioxide um, as a gate dielectric, and silicon nitride as intermetal dielectric. So this is the technology, the specific technology that we use in this work. So how does it perform and why do we want to use it? This is a table that compares this technology to silicon chips that we are used to. Um, so these are some ballpark numbers actually. Can deviate a bit, but just to show you the, uh, the order of magnitude, the differences. So first, uh, core supply voltages can go uh, below one volt in silicon chips. Uh, in the technology that we use, we are still at five to 10 volts. Um, which leads, among, uh, together with other factors, to a higher power consumption in general. Then the charge carrier mobility. This is the speed at which electrons and holes can move uh, through uh, the channel of the transistor under the influence of an electric field. This charge carrier mobility is a lot lower in the technology that we use, which leads to a much lower performance. Then the transistor density is much lower which means that we need a much larger area for the same functionality. The semiconductor type is only N-type, uh, which leads to unipolar logic, 
which is usually less reliable or needs more transistors to reach the same reliability. So I only said negative things up to now. So what's the positive thing about this technology? Uh, the most positive thing is the cost. So as you can see here, um, the cost of one transistor is much lower uh, in this technology than in a silicon chip. And another advantage, of course, is the flexibility. So the chips are bendable and stretchable, which means they can be integrated in, like I said, plastic, paper, cardboard, etc. So what is the challenge that we tackled here? Um, so we noticed that nobody looked at um, secure communication be between these flexible tags and a reader yet. So we had a look at it, um, and we saw that there are many challenges that we need to tackle. Uh, but we started with a few of these challenges, and what we did in this work is um, to integrate a crypto core in the flexible chip. And the reason why this is challenging is uh, because up to now, only like this amount, oops, sorry, only this amount of transistors, like 3,504 transistors, was the maximum that was integrated into one chip. Because otherwise, if you go higher, the reliability becomes questionable. So that was a challenge, and we wanted to show that we can have more transistors uh, for our work to, to serve as a driver for technology researchers to show like there are other applications that need more transistors. So that was one thing. And then the other thing, we wanted um, to make sure that the key bits could not be read out. And there's two reasons for this. So these chips are not packaged. So they, they, it's just the bare die that, that, uh, that is used. That's one thing, and also the features are very large. So like I uh, said before, the, the density of the number of transistors per square millimeter or centimeter is much lower, so, so you, can, you can really see the transistors uh, very easily under a microscope. So that makes it very easy to look at the circuits, actually. The other thing is that there is no, or currently no electrically readable, writable, erasable memory. So we cannot have ROM memory, for example. So we need to find other solutions to program the key. And these other solutions are much more visible than programming, programming a bit into ROM, as I will show later. So um, I will go over our implementation now. So which choices that we made in this design? Uh, first of all, the algorithm. So the most important um, factor there was that we needed the least number of transistors possible. Uh, and then we checked. And Catan 10, 32 is the algorithm that, um, as far as our knowledge reaches, has uh, the least number of transistors uh, reported up to now. Uh, it has a block size of 32 bits, key size of 80 bits, and it has a fixed key, which means that the key, uh, it doesn't have a key register, but the key is supposed to be burned into the device um, and, and is thus, uh, thus cannot be changed. So it, it consists of two shift registers and some logic. Um, and this is what we implemented. So the way we implemented it is uh, in a serial architecture. So we have three input bits, a start bit, a clock bit, and one bit for the plain text to be shifted in, in a serial manner. Then we have two output bits, a ready bit, and then one cipher text bit, text bit that shifts out also in a serial manner while the ready signal is high. So then you get this architecture. Then when we go one level down, what do the standard cells look like? So like I said, we can only have n-type transistors, so we cannot have CMOS logic, no pull-up, pull-down network. Um, so we have to use other types of cells, like, like people used 30, 40 years ago when there were only uh, NMOS transistors uh, in silicon chips. Um, and that leads us uh, to uh, this uh, gate um, construction. <coughs> Sorry. So this is called uh, pseudo-CMOS logic. And it consists of two stages. So in the first stage, there is an NMOS pull-up uh, transistor connected to a bias vol voltage uh, in combination with a pull-down uh, network consisting of N-type N transistors as well. The output of this stage goes to a second stage uh, and drives a pull-up N-type transistor uh, supplied by uh, the power supply voltage, and it repeats the pull-down network. If you make sure that the bias voltage is at least um, equal to the supply voltage plus two times the threshold voltage of a transistor, then you can make sure that the output range 
of this gate is between ground and VDD. Uh, and this is important to get real-to-real uh, -real behavior and higher reliability. So this also means that we need, uh, because for an end gate, we need two um, n-type transistors uh, in the pull-down network work. So that means that we need six of these thin film transistors for one NAND gate, while this, is, this number is four in silicon um, standard cell technologies. Then one level down is the transistor, but I already showed you the transistor. So this is again this cross section. Then when we look at the layout, this is just a picture that, is, uh, that we drew uh, from the layout. So you can see that we used uh, 4,044 um, thin film transistors for an area of 331 and a half square millimeters. So this is very large. It's almost two centimeters by two centimeters. Um, and on top we have the place where the 80 key bits uh, are being programmed. I will zoom into that later because it's uh, the second part of the talk actually. And at the bottom, we have 48 pads uh, to connect IO pins, um, supply voltage, bias voltage, and ground voltage. And some of these pads are actually unused, but um, the reason why we use uh, this structure is because we can then easily connect to a probe card for testing afterwards. So this is our measurement setup. This is the chip again, the 48 uh, pads to connect to the chip. These connect to the, yeah, if you can see it, uh, there are 48 needles here. So these are probes that are connected to a probe card. The probe card is here. It connects to a PCB that contains level shifters to make sure that we can communicate with an FPGA. And the FPGA sends the test vectors and takes back uh, the response from the chip to check if the, if the output is correct. So we fixed uh, the 80-bit key. I will tell you later how we fixed it. Uh, so this is the value, not important in hex. Uh, we applied a thousand plain text automatically and then received the thousand uh, cipher text. Actually, we repeated this many times also, so there's more than a thousand plain text applied. Um, and we got correct outputs for these combinations, like VDD uh, 10 volts and VBIAS 15 volts, and also 11 volts for VDD and 16 and a half volts for uh, VBIAS. The maximum clock frequency that we could reach was 10 kilohertz, um, and the number of cycles to complete one Catan uh, 10 encryption was 32 for shifting in the plain text, 254 for doing the encryption, and 32 for shifting out the ciphertext. Um, at the clock frequency of 10 kilohertz, this means 31.8 milliseconds, which is a lot, of course. Um, but like I said before, um, these types of chips are used for applications that do not need speed, uh, do not need a small area, but mainly need low, low cost and flexibility. So then when we look at the key programming, so this is actually, um, so you can see the 80 key bits here, and I just took a part of it. Uh, this is an image uh, that was taken under the microscope. So this is, this is not the, the layout drawing anymore, but this is the real chip. So as you can see, we have a power rail and a ground rail here. Then we have um, a number of bits, 11 on this picture, 11 of the 80 key bits that are connected both to the VDD and the ground rail. Uh, that's how the chip is fabricated. And then you can see part of the logic here. When we zoom into this part, then you can see how we made sure that uh, before using the chip, uh, one of the connections is broken. So actually what we did is we used the laser to break every time for each key bit one of both connections. So it's a very simple way to either connect a key bit to uh, a logical one or to connect a key bit to a logical zero. But you can see the problem here. So this is an image that could be taken with a very cheap microscope actually uh, even. Uh, the problem is that you can, e oh, sorry, that you can easily uh, read out uh, the key bits. So you can easily see the 80 bit key. So that's why we propose a solution to hide the key. Um, and first, you should look at the left side of the slide. This is the concept that we proposed. So if you look at the graph here, on the y-axis you can see the current that flows through the transistor. And on the x-axis you can see the voltage that is applied at the input of the transistor. If you look at the full line only first, 
then you can see that if you apply a fixed negative voltage at the input of the transistor, that the transistor is off because it only starts conducting from, uh, only starts conducting when the input voltage is larger than the threshold voltage of the transistor. But if we then um, heat up the, the source and the drain of the transistor, this VT value shifts to the left, which means that this curve also shifts to the left and we get the dotted curve. If you then apply the same fixed input voltage, the transistor suddenly switches from, on, from off to on. So this way, by lasering, we can um, make a transistor change its mode from off to on. And that has the same effect as um, having a wire that is first uh, open or a connection that is first open and then closed. So there's two options now to uh, use um, this phenomenon. So on the right side of the slide at the top, you can see the first option. So what we can do is we can use a pull-up uh, N-type transistor um, to connect the key bit to a logical one, and then a pull-down N-type transistor that has this fixed negative voltage at, it, at its input. If we don't do anything, the key bit is one. If we then use a laser on this bottom uh, transistor, then this transistor starts drawing uh, a current. And if we make sure that this transistor is larger than the top one, then this one wins from the top one and the, the key bit is, uh, it becomes zero. A second option for programming the key bits um, is to just use uh, two transistors that are connected to this negative input voltage and then choose which one uh, to laser in order to choose which one um, will be connected either to the uh, power supply or to the ground. Of course, the, the value that comes out here is PDD minus the threshold voltage, but that's still high enough to be used in the rest of the chip. So then we uh, experimentally validated this approach. Um, and the first experiments were actually disappointing because we could see the difference between a transistor that had been lasered and a transi transistor that had not been lasered. So what you can see here is the top view of the chip also uh, an image uh, made with uh, the microscope, under a microscope. So on the left side, you can see a transistor that has been lasered, and you can see these, yeah, maybe the quality of the images is not good enough, but you can see the lines here. It's a bit darker, so, so maybe I should say that this is the gate, the horizontal line, and these are the source and the drain. And you can see the small lines here or the darker orange color for the transistor that has been lasered because this one has not been lasered, and you can see that this yellow part is everywhere the same color. I don't know if you can see it, I hope so. So the problem is that the difference is, at least we could see it when we, when we looked at it under the microscope. So the problem is that the difference is visible between a thin film transistor that has been lasered and one that has not been lasered. So we had to find a solution. Uh, and our solution is that we try to apply different laser settings. So actually we, we, we explored 20 or 30 uh, laser settings to see if every laser setting had the same effect on the transistor. And what we saw is that for some laser settings, uh, we actually really got this VT shift that I showed uh, on one of the previous slides. And for, for some other laser settings, the VT shift was very minimal. So the curve almost did not shift to the left. And the good thing is that um, these two images look similar. So you can see for both transistors that, that they have been lasered. So it's both a bit darker orange, but the VT shift is different. Uh, so we applied two different settings. Uh, at the top, we use an attenuation of 45 uh, dB in low energy mode, and we applied one pulse. And then uh, our experiments showed that applying an a laser with an attenuation uh, or a beam with an attenuation of 35 dB in low energy mode and, and with two pulses um, gave us this result. So if we now apply a negative voltage of minus five volts, then in the top case, before lasering we get the blue curve and after lasering we get the red curve. So in the top setting, applying this fixed voltage makes the transistor go from off to on. And in the bottom setting, applying this negative voltage uh, and then lasering the transistor does not change the state of the transistor, so it stays off. So we can now easily apply this to one of these two settings to program the key bits in an invisible way. 
So to conclude, um, oops, we presented uh, the first cryptographic uh, core on Flex4. Uh, we presented an, a solution for the invisible programming of the qubits. Uh, and actually there are many more uh, security challenges to be tackled. Um, the technology is rapidly improving and, and will soon also be ready for mainstream applications. So that shows the importance of really tackling these ch security challenges and making sure that we can guarantee the security of, um, of chips in this technology for future applications. Right, that concludes my talk. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Uh, we're running a bit late, but maybe somebody has a question. Um, is congratulations, great talk, fun research project. Um, one question, one possible remaining attack is probably just a direct probing of the transistor, I assume, right? Yeah. And you can do an well, exhaustive search, and we, you can probably almost manually, right? Yeah. Pet the transistors. Yeah, okay. so actually, uh, other things that we could do is to cover, um, which would also be an option to hide the key, actually, to cover the foil with uh, ink. But then we would have, I mean, such that you cannot see where the transistors are. Yeah. And usually this ink is hard to remove um, by mechanical means mm. because you would break the chip. Mm. But there might be solvents that can solve the ink and it's, it's a, I mean, we should investigate it. We didn't look at it yet, but that could be a solution to prevent that. And then we would have to apply ink on both sides, of course, because you can access the transistors actually. So you probably could get medium level security at, yeah, at pretty low cost. Like that. uh, that's, yeah, that's good. But it's all over. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Neilan again.